My message tonight, winning the lost, one at a time. One at a time. Call it one at, one at a time evangelism, what you will, but it's winning the lost, one at a time. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you the way you've been leading this church. You're leading us out to the streets again. You're leading us to the lost. Lord, we thank you for a, a full church. We thank you, Lord, for an overflowing church. Thank you for all the souls. Thank you for the water baptisms. Many, many coming, being baptized and saved and healed. And you've been meeting the finances. You've been blessing. But, oh, God, we have a city here that's lost and going to hell. We have, we have a church here, Lord, so full of energy, of people ready to do something. Oh, God, lead us, direct us. Give us your mind, Holy Ghost. Teach us. Lord, uh, Pastor Carter uh, gave us a wonderful word Sunday afternoon on this, and we continued on those very lines to this evening. Lord, you're saying something to us. You're leading us. Uh, Lord, I'm asking that everybody that calls Times Square Church their home to hear this tonight, and let it be meat, and let it be life, and let it be changing to us, life-changing in us, we pray. Make every one of us soul winners. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, we've been praying in this church for a number of weeks now that the Holy Ghost would show us how to reach this city of this greater metropolitan area of over 17 and a half million people. Think of it. The majority of them going to hell. Absolutely lost. Living in darkness. I live on the 30th floor over here a block away. And there's hardly a night that I don't look out over Midtown and Lower Manhattan. I can see all the way down to Statue of Liberty. And I tell you, I've spent many times weeping and crying. I look out the window and say, oh, God, look at these skyscrapers. And in some of those uh, units, five or six skyscrapers, there can be as many as 30, 40,000 people living in those few buildings. And I say, oh, God, they look like tombstones to me. They're beautiful buildings, but these people are dying. God, how do we reach them? Even folks... Uh, there's probably five, six thousand that, uh, that worship in this church now. But folks, that's just a, a cupful out of this city. It's incredible. And we have to have the leading of the Holy Ghost. God has to give us ways and means. He has to teach us how. And I've come to believe that when we really get the mind of the Holy Spirit, His, His methods are not going to be expensive. That puts us in the hole financially. It's not going to cause a lot of sweat where people are running around trying to figure things out. And it's not going to be complicated. And finally, it's going to be something that every single believer can be involved in. Not just a handful, but everyone, simple, inexpensive, and, and, and not complicated, and no sweat involved. I mean human sweat. Doesn't mean that we don't work hard, but human sweat is not involved. And when the Holy Ghost teaches or speaks, He always points to Christ. When we begin to pray about how to do anything, the Holy Ghost, when He comes, He's not going to just give us direction. He's going to point us to Jesus. That's why He's here. And He's going to tell us, look at the life of Jesus. Look at how He did things and try to follow in His example. Now, I'm, I'm going to do that tonight. Uh, we're going to study the Lord's methods of evangelism, one-on-one -on -one evangelism. I could talk to you about Nicodemus, I can talk to you about many, many, but I'm going to talk to you about the Samaritan woman, this one-on-one -on -one evangelism of Jesus Christ. But first let me tell you, there is a place for mass evangelism. I was involved in mass evangelism for many years. I've traveled crusades all over the world, as many as 50,000 people at a time in South America and other countries. I'm, I'm not against evangelism on television or radio. Uh, literature evangelism. But folks, let me tell you something. All of these methods are so impersonal. There's not the personal contact. The, the people don't have an opportunity to unburden their heart. There's nobody to talk to. It's not personal. And the Lord is going to show us tonight the importance of personal one-on-one -on -one evangelism. <clears throat> this is the greatest need, I believe, in the nation and in this city especially. Do you know that these... Uh, I listen, I don't have television, so I listen to the radio when I'm in a car. And, and I was listening the other night to someone, I think she called herself Dr. Laura or something. And, and uh, the calls that were coming in there, even from young people, and just unburdening their heart. And, and they say that these, these call-in radio programs were absolutely inundated. 
They're, they can't even handle the calls enough when people are frustrated and just want somebody to talk to. In fact, there's a, 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 there's a commercial now on radio and says, do you need somebody to talk to? We have counselors and you call. It's $45 for the first half hour and then so much on down the line. And they are swamped. They can't handle the calls even at $45 a clip. You see, people want to talk to somebody. This city is so impersonal, there's nobody to talk to, no one to unburden their, their hearts to. You say, well, let them tell it to Jesus. Well, how can they tell them to Jesus, tell it to Jesus when they don't know him? They can't talk to Jesus like you can, like I can. When I first came to, to New York in 1958, I weighed 115 pounds. Now, look at me, I've gained 40 pounds since then. They used to tell me, drink pink Kool-Aid and your thermometer. I mean, I had, I had more names called at me when I came here. In fact, I think I told you when I first came the first year, uh, I had a man knock on my door. It was Mr. Universe. He was a Christian. Mr. Universe. All muscle. No neck. All muscle. <laughs> and he said, are you, are you Brother Dave? And I, I said, yeah. He, he said, God sent me. He looked down at 115 pound runt. And he said, God told me to build you up and make you a muscle man so you can be effective on the streets. I looked at that monster man. I said, I said, here's what I said. I said, if I looked like you, I wouldn't last a week. They'd be challenging me. Nobody challenges me. We became dear friends, but as you see, I didn't take his advice. <laughs> but when I first came to New York in 1958, I came as a broken-hearted man. I used to weep every day, and I, I bought a little motor scooter, and I would scoot all over the city. I remember coming over the Manhattan Bridge, and those ridges there would, they would go like this. And I had to pray, cover the blood every time I went over the Manhattan Bridge. I don't think there's a neighborhood you live in that I wasn't there. And I would get on my knees in the morning before I left the apartment and I would say, Lord, you've got to lead me. I would go all over this city. The first few visits when I came to this city, even before I moved to the city, I, I was thinking about it this afternoon, and yesterday especially, reliving the first time that I went into a section in Brooklyn, right over the Brooklyn Bridge, between Brooklyn and Manhattan Bridge, and I went into a section there. I knew nothing about drugs, but I had a broken heart. I wanted to win people to Christ. I wanted to win gangs and drug addicts, because that's what the Lord told me to do. He sent me here to 115 pounds and a broken heart. And I remember the first witness of a group of gang members and drug rather drug addicts the gangs had broken up in 1958 prior to that there were there were over 300 known gangs registered gangs or gangs that had been listed by the police department in 1958 the gangs began to break up because everybody turned to drugs everybody all the kids on the street were drugs. everybody was out for themselves they weren't even interested in fighting anymore because they're trying to support their habit I would see kids uh, in the wintertime with just a t-shirt and I couldn't understand. I didn't know what it was, what they, I, I didn't even know what the word high meant. Never talked to a drug, never seen a drug addict in my life. I came from a little town of about a thousand people. And, and you, you, at th that time the only people really using drugs, America thought, were a few musicians smoking pot. But suddenly heroin hit this city like a bomb. And up and down these streets, you would see kids laying everywhere, strewn on the streets. And I went into this section, and I just walked out, and I said, look, I'm a country preacher. I don't know anything. And I could see tracks on the thing, and I could see them scratching. And I saw glassy eyes, and I presumed they were drug addicts. And I introduced myself. I said, I'm a country preacher. I'm here to talk to you about Jesus. They started calling me preach. I, I, I go back there. But I remember one time they said, Reverend, you can't talk to us yet 
until you listen. Look, we're, we're sick. We need to get a fix. If you want to come up and wait till we get fixed, then we'll listen to you. I went up with five drug addicts on a, a black rooftop in, in Brooklyn, and I watched them pull out a needle, a dirty needle, and they had a Coke bottle full of cold water, and he stuck the syringe, and they had a little bottle cap, and they put a little piece of uh, felt in it, into the heroin and water, and they were mixing in this little bottle cap, and they put the, a little bit of uh, felt in there. So what's the felt for? He said, well, we dry it out, and then if we can't get it fixed tomorrow, we squeeze it out and try to get at least a little bit of high. And I watched them stick the needle in a Coke bottle, swish it, and I said, what are you doing that? He said, I'm sterilizing the needle. Cold water, dirty water, he's sterilizing the needle. And I watched the first kid, we were up on the top of this flat rooftop, you could look over all of Brooklyn, and I watched the first kid shoot up, and his eyeballs were yellow, he was full of jaundice. And, and his, he filled the needle with blood, then shot, got the heroin out of the bottle cap and shot, took off the rubber band and passed it to the next guy. He, there was still blood in it. He mixed it and shot it in his veins, and I passed out, literally passed out. When I came out, they had dragged me out from the stairwell, and they had all gotten a fix by now. And uh, one of me, what's the matter, preach? Couldn't take it? I said, no, 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 that's not it. I said, I can stand blood. But I said, I can't stand dirty blood. He's got jaundice. You all going to have jaundice. They said, so what? And, and so they said, you want to talk to us? Now you talk. I, they sat in the corner scratching, getting high. And, and one of them said, Preacher, look, we don't do this now to get a thrill. We don't even take it to get high. One boy said, I take it so I won't kill myself. I've lost my wife, I've lost my kids, I've lost everything. I'm living like an animal. He said, there's no more thrill. He said, I don't like what's happened to me because I've become an animal. I don't like to steal and I don't like to plunder. Found out another said, my, my mom's a hallelujah woman. I means she's Pentecostal church. She prays for me. I know all about that. And I listened and I got an education. Folks, I, the Lord wouldn't let me condemn and say, you're filthy drug addicts, you're going to hell. God wouldn't let me throw a bunch of scriptures at him. The Holy Ghost said, you sit and listen and you learn. You learn their pain, you hear their heart, and you just listen. Folks, we've got so many Jesus cops anymore. We, we've got stormtroopers for Christ who go out on the streets and just storm at people and throw scripture verses like arrows that cut them. They, we don't listen to people anymore. We're not hearing what people are saying anymore. We just don't go out and just, just, just listen. I missed it yesterday, and I've asked God to forgive me because I was leaving my office down 50th Street, and I, I walked, and I was busy, and I was in a hurry, and there's a kid, teenager, probably 18, 19 years age, he's just sitting on the, right outside the office, and he's down with his hand between his knees and just shaking and crying, and I, I, I thought, I've got to go sit by, I've got to just ask him why he's crying. But then my flesh rose up. You see, I'm a preacher now, and I preach in a fancy church, and I don't have that same burden I had when I came here. And I said, oh, he, he probably just got disappointed, and he won't listen to me now. Nobody listens anymore. And I went by. And when I got down, I got so ashamed of what I had done, and, and I just went on. I missed it, and I, I felt lovingly rebuked by my Heavenly Father, because I walked by a crying young man that I could have probably reached. How many of us are doing that? How many of us are not listening to people? How many are not even trying to get involved anymore? I've come to a place where I said, Lord, if I have to take two weeks off or even just do it once a week, I want to go back into Spanish Harlem. I want to go back to Brooklyn. I'd like to spend a day a week going back talking to those so I don't lose that touch. So that I learn to hear once again. So that, that, that we're not just sitting in God's house soaking in all the blessings and keeping it to ourselves. Folks, we're going to lose it if we don't get involved in the lives of people. I remember those kids. The Lord finally allowed me to start winning them. I remember meeting Sonny Argonzoni. 
His mother, Pentecostal woman, he's under an elevated train right off that, uh, there was an elevated train that's not there anymore. And it'll find a little peach itself. He thought I was a narco, a narco agent, narcotic agent. And I said, no, I'm a preacher. I'm from the country. And he said, oh, you're just like my mother. She's praying for me all the time. Don't tell me she put you on me. I said, no, God, the Holy Ghost put me on you. Of course, you know, Sonny Arkansas today is pastoring a church of 10,000, and he's got pastors all over the United States doing a great work for God. But you see, Sonny led me to Jose. Jose led me to Julio. And Julio led me to... to uh, uh, I've got their names. I was remember today. There was Joe. There was Jose. There was Sonny. There was Nikki. There was Julio. There was Roberto. There was Israel and Lefty and Shorty and Bobby and Freddie and Inky and Nelson. On and on. One at a time. There was no mass evangelism. There were no tent meetings. There were no literature crusades. There was no citywide anything. It was one on one. A skinny preacher, 115 years, 115 pounds. I told you that four times. I won't say it again. <laughs> but I was praying and said, Lord, how are we going to reach this city? I'm not satisfied just to stand in, in Times Square and preach. Now, folks, I, I'm committed to this church. I have no plans of leaving, and no, no devil in hell going to chase me either. Or Pastor Carter. We're here to minister the word of the Lord. A bunch of devils tried right out of hell. Demon powers tried to, to, to destroy this work when he couldn't do it. But, but see, Jesus gives us a powerful message in the fourth chapter of John. Just open the, the Bible, the fourth chapter of John, because I'm going to be taking you into that now. What a powerful message he's given us on one by one evangelism. Now, folks, listen to me. He gathers his disciples together and he leaves these Christ rejecting Pharisees in Judea. And the Bible said he needed to go, he needs to go through Samaria. Now, listen to me, please. Jesus was man. He was touched with every feeling that you and I have. He was man. He subjected himself in flesh to partake of all of our human frailties and feelings, except he did not sin. But he was also God in flesh. He knew all things. And he's going to teach his church and his disciples. He's going to teach us how to reach the lost. He's going to approach what he called himself a white harvest field. He's going to go... To a, he's going to go into Samaria, a, a place that is totally heathen, full of adulterers and fornicators. In fact, the name of Sychar itself means town of drunkards. He's going to this town of drunkards and uh, perversion and sin, the same kind of society that we face. He, he's going to take his disciples into a white harvest field. He said it's ripe to harvest right now. It needs laborers. And he's going to go there. And he's not going to hold a tent crusade. Now, we know they had tents in those days because Paul was a tent maker. I'm not against tent meetings. Not at all. Those things have their place. He's not going to send his apostles out, his disciples out, and spread the word all over. There's going to be a mass crusade in, in a local church or in, in, in a city hall. No, he's not going to send for Jerusalem for 120 workers and bring them in and blitz the city. He, he's going to be led by the Holy Ghost in a marvelous way of teaching. Now, everything Jesus did was a teaching pattern for us. Jesus never said a word, didn't do anything, but what it was a teaching for us. We're taught by his life and every word and every action of Jesus Christ. And what a wonderful thing Jesus did. And I want to take you step by step on how Jesus taught us to be involved in one by one evangelism. First thing, Jesus faces that great white harvest, wholly led by the Holy Ghost, totally led by the Holy Spirit. And he must needs go through Samaria, verse 4, chapter 4, verse 4. And he must needs go through Samaria. A necessity came upon him. It is important, it's necessary that I go through Samaria. Now, the Holy Ghost had, had, had made it clear. He's God. The Holy Spirit really is the Spirit of Jesus Christ. Now, listen very closely. This is going to be totally prearranged by the Lord, by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's going to take him into a heathen 
nation ripe to harvest to a people ready to hear the gospel. He's going to take him, not only there, he's going to take him into a little town called Sychar. He's going to take him to a parcel of ground where there's a well. He's going to put him there about noontime, the sixth hour of the day. He's going to put them there at a certain time, a certain place, at a certain time when humanly he's weary. And he comes into Samaria, into the white harvest field. He said himself, it's white unto harvest. Now, Jesus, the Jews did not go through Samaria to get to Jerusalem when they went to worship. They didn't go there at all. In fact, they went through an area called Perea. In fact, according to Hosea the prophet, Hosea 6, 9, those who went to Samaria faced troops of robbers waiting at the borders and false priests who murdered and committed all kinds of lewdness. It was unsafe to go through. The Jews hated the, the Gentiles, and especially the Samaritans were the most hated of all. Jesus said, I have to go through Samaria. This is the call and the ministry and the revelation of the Holy Spirit. He is led there. He's led to a parcel of ground. In verse, in, in, in Isaiah, Isaiah 10, 5 and 6, no, no, it's not there. It, it, uh, Go not into the way of the Gentiles, the scripture said, and into any city of the Samaritans enter ye not, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. His, his going to Samaria was not in keeping with the original commission. The original commission is don't go to Samaria. But now they have evangelized the Jews. They have been fulfilled that. And now the Holy Ghost is going to teach the church, and especially the disciples, how to evangelize the heathen, how to evangelize the lost. The Holy Spirit is now ready to teach the disciples one-on-one -on -one evangelism. The Holy Spirit is going to lead Jesus. The Scripture says, <clears throat> I'm, I'm reading verse 5 now. Then cometh he to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now, listen to it, please. I want to show you how detailed the direction of the Holy Spirit is. A necessity to go. And you're going to go, the Holy Spirit is leading Jesus now to a certain parcel of ground, a plot of ground. Now, think of that. Out of the whole... Uh, countryside, miles and miles, he's going to be planted in this parcel of ground, the scripture says, by Jacob's well. Jacob's well, they said, was 75 feet deep, 9, 10 feet in diameter, and he's sitting on the diameter, perhaps, of the well. And God is going, the Holy Ghost is going to arrange that the disciples are going to go out and get food. He's probably going to leave John with him, the beloved, because John's the only one who recorded this. And it, even though Jesus would have retold it, perhaps, he couldn't have told it. He wouldn't have told it in such detail. John had to have been there listening and seeing and witnessing this. And not only that, the Holy Ghost is not only going to direct him so clearly to sit at that well at noontime, but he's going to move on a woman. And not only a woman, he's going to move on a... An adulterous woman, a Gentile, Samaritan, hated by the Jew woman. Holy Ghost is not going to bring a lady of class. He's not going to bring some rich lady in purple. He will find one of the most uh, cheating, husband cheating, fornicating woman around. Evidently, every man in Sychar knew her because they later came at her testimony. Amazing arrangements of the Holy Ghost. How clearly this is set up by the Holy Ghost. What a setup. Do you know God is still in control like that? God still leads his people. We're to be as Jesus was on this earth. Hallelujah. He can lead you and guide you and direct you the first 10 years. Everywhere I went, I was led by the Holy Spirit that way. I, I hope and believe I'm still led by the Holy Ghost like that. There are times I, God won't let me speak to somebody because they're not ready. The Bible says, don't cast your pearls before swine unless they tend and rend you. They'll tear you up. You have to have the, 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 the wisdom and the guidance of the Holy Spirit. More than ever, I'm totally convinced there can be no truly effective reaching of the lost 
unless it's directed by the Holy Spirit. If it's not clearly directed by the Holy Spirit in answer to sincere, godly prayer, it's going to end up in sweat, it's going to be costly, and it's not going to be effective in the long run. It's going to look good on paper, but it's not going to have any lasting results. Only that which is birthed by the Holy Ghost in the womb of the Holy Ghost and given to us by revelation is going to work. I'm convinced of that. I've been back in New York City now for 10 years evangelizing and I'm totally convinced. Nothing, absolutely nothing. I know churches that have 100, 150 programs and many of them don't work because they're inventions of somebody's mind. We can't sit around trying to invent evangelism programs. We have to be on our face saying, God, you tell us what to do. You need us, Holy Ghost. I, I'll tell you, I am, I am so enamored of the providence of God. I, I was thinking, I was just meditating on Esther last night. I got so excited at this idea of how the Holy Ghost leads and how providence, the providence of God works out every detail if you trust Him and believe Him. Ahasuerus, the king, what are the odds? Think of it. What are the odds that this man can't sleep? Just right after there's been a decision to kill all the Jews and the Holy Ghost keeps him up, he can't sleep. Now, what would you think a king of a mighty empire would do because he had provinces all over the world? Wouldn't you think uh, he'd call for uh, a music team, uh, musicians or a violinist to, to soothe him to sleep? Don't you think if he, if he wanted a book, he'd call for something on botany or horses or chariots? What are the odds that he would turn to his servant and he says, go to the chamber of, of uh, records. It's like reading the National Register or the Constitution. He said, I want you to go and I want you to go in the chamber and pick out a book, any book, and bring it to me and read it to me. Now, this serve, what are the odds that that servant goes into this huge building? Look at our city buildings down here where the records are, just for New York City, for example. Now, this is a record place for all the provinces. Provinces spread all over the world on all languages. Books upon books upon books, room after room after room after books, and what are the odds? That this servant goes in and he picks up the <laughs> records of the city of Shushan, where the palace is. And what are the odds when he gets back and the king is still waiting? What are the odds that the king is still awake? He go, This servant goes in and he looks around and he, he, he says, well, I, I think not, there's nothing, and I'll take this one. He brings this big book of records. What are the odds he's going to open it and it falls? Right on the story about Mordecai who had exposed the plot to kill the king. What are the odds that that king is going to sit there and listen to this story and suddenly he listens to it and, and, and he suddenly says, wait a minute, wait a minute, he says, this man who, who exposed the plot to kill me, has he been rewarded? I don't know. What are the odds that this impetuous king, this king who's had many people murdered at just the look? What are the odds that he says, now, it had to be still dark early in the morning. What are the odds that he's going to say, go out in the outer courtyard and find the first person that's still in the court, any one of my servants, and go get my royal horse and put my royal robe on it and go get Mordecai and get the trumpeters and parade him around the streets and honor him. And what are the odds that, Morde that Haman, who just built a gallows to kill Mordecai, what are the odds that he can't sleep and he's got to come in now just at the time the king says, go out and find who's coming in? What are the odds? And he walks in Asking, he's going to tell the king, I want to kill Mordecai. And what are the odds that he's told, would you go get the horse? There's a, there, there's a man I want to honor. He's, oh, I'm going to be honored. No, 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 no. Mordecai, the Jew, put him on the horse. And you walk in front of the horse and trade him all over the streets. What are the odds? 
Don't tell me the Holy Ghost is not in charge. Holy Ghost is in charge. Hallelujah. Brother Carter, I was thinking about that last night. I got to praising God in my heart. I said, God, I'm going to trust you. Look at that. You move the hearts of men. You're in control. Every one of us should be praying, God, you lead me. Holy Ghost, lead me. Lead me. Let, let me take an afternoon on Saturday. Just, just walk the street. You lead me to those. All, all of our, our, our converts, everybody, we ought to be praying, God, lead me to the one that you have prepared. And secondly, Jesus dealt with racial prejudice head on. That's one thing Jesus would not stand for. And boy, he sets the example here. There cometh the woman of Samaria to draw water. Now this woman is absolutely shocked at what Jesus did. Jesus simply said, woman, would you give me a drink of water? Now that blew her away because, in, in fact, she says, how is it that thou being a Jew, ask a drink of me, which am a woman? Not only a woman, but a woman of Samaria. A double line of prejudice. Because you see, the, the, the rabbis at the time uh, would not allow a woman to be educated spiritually. She's not to have any spiritual education at all. She's not even to be taught, except at home. Some rabbis refused to eat the bread of Samaritans. In fact, they said it's more defiling than eating pig's meat or swine's flesh. In fact, the Gentile it would just walk by a priest or a Jew and his garment just swished their body. They had to go and wash their clothes because they were defiled. And of all people, they wouldn't even receive the Samaritans as proselytes. And that same prejudice was still in the early Pentecostal church. Remember how Paul had to call Peter down, or Peter, uh, Peter down for, for uh, delving in just a little bit of this pre prejudice? The, the Christian... Uh, Jews were not even eating with the Gentile Christians. That wall was still there. And Jesus deals with it now. Uh, Holy Ghost chooses a woman, not only a woman, but a Samaritan woman who is totally despised by the Jews of the time, even the Christian Jews, those who believed on Jesus. This woman is a victim of terrible prejudice. And being an adulteress, if she were in Jerusalem, they'd want to stone her. And Jesus trampled on that prejudice right on the spot. Think of that. I'm going to tell you, you cannot be a soul winner. If you have any, not if you have the slightest bit of prejudice in your soul. You have discredited yourself completely to being a witness to Jesus Christ. You cannot be a soul winner. If there's the slightest bit of prejudice in your heart, if you say, well, I'm just going, I'm white, I'm going to go and speak only to white people. Or I'm black, I'm going to speak to black people. I, I'm uh, Mexican, I'm going to speak only to Mexicans. No, you see, when Jesus was crucified, that ended this idea, well, uh, I happen to, I, I am... Uh, I am Philippine, or I am Mexican, or I am German, or I am Finnish, I am all that. You see, all those walls were brought down. Now, listen to me now. You, you may have been born a Finn, you may have been born a Mexican, you may have been a, born a Nigerian, but you were reborn as we've all been reborn. There is now one blood there is no color, and we are all one bone of his bone, flesh of his flesh. There's only one, 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 one. You can't be involved in one-on-one -on -one evangelism if you have any prejudice. You're going to have to ask God to take this out of my heart. Do it completely and do it now. Hmm. Jesus understood what I've learned to understand. And I learned that when I first came to New York City. And here's the lesson. Jesus understood that the worst of sinners have the widest circle of friends who are at the wit's end and most open to the gospel. 
They have the widest circle of friends. I hope you did you hear what I said? That's where the white harvest field was. First of all, she had five husbands she cheated on. That's quite a circle. They may have already been remarried again. That would have been ten. And she had a husband she's living with and she's not married to. That's eleven. And he had a family. I don't know how many children could have been involved. But then all of the circle of friends, because if, if she's an adulteress, she knows every other adulteress in town because people of like sin meet other people of like sin. Just like they're doing this church, every homosexual within an hour, he knows every homosexual in the church. And he meets them. They all get together. What a circle she had. Folks, when we first came here and set up Teen Challenge, what we decided to do every Friday night, we had family night. Because when a drug addict would get saved, he'd tell his dad, mom, and brother, sister, and all of his friends, and we would have family night. And they were the most open people, ready to get saved right there. What every, especially the, the, the uh, Hispanics. I mean, big families. And Friday night, we'd have as many as 30 from one family come because they're, their relative, that boy, that, that nephew, whoever it was, grandma's there, grandpa, everybody. I want what he got. I want to be saved. We had hundreds saved. Have you been inviting your family to the house of God to hear the gospel? Have you been witnessing to them? Come on, all you guys. Have you been telling your families? Girls? You, you get them here, we'll get them to the altar. You get them in the church, we'll... But you should be witnessing to them. Amen. One of these nights, we're going to have to have just, everybody's been delivered from drugs and alcohol, have just family night. Just get all your families in here. Hallelujah. Shall I go on? The woman left her water pot, went her way into the city, and saith to the men. She went back to all her husbands. Come see a man which told me all things that I ever did. Is not this the Christ? You can imagine, he had to be the Christ to know who you are. That amazed them and they came and they were so open, they begged him. He stayed two days because they invited him. He'd left Judea where they had cast him aside and now here he is being received by this wicked society because there was no prejudice and they knew it. Thirdly, Jesus in his one on one ministry, never condemned, but rather he offered hope and life. The Bible tells us that the sinner is dead in trespasses and sins, so there's no quality of life at all. Every sinner around you, they can laugh, they can put on a front, but they have no life. Jesus knew this woman was living in adultery. He knew her past life, one adulterous affair after another. That before a single word is said about her sins, he's offering her life. He's saying to her, if, if you just knew who I am, if you would just trust me, I'll give you water. I'll give you something to satisfy that longing in your heart. I'll give you living water. He's giving her hope. He's not condemning her. He, he's not embarrassed by her sins. Folks, if, if you find out that somebody you're dealing with is, is deep into homosexuality or deep into drugs or into alcohol, and you show some kind of embarrassment, you can't reach them. There was no embarrassment. There was nothing but love. There was no... Jesus said, neither I condemn you. Go and sin no more. He didn't come to condemn the lost. He came to save the lost. And we can't be one-on-one -on -one evangelists if we, if, if we do not... Listen to me, please. We can't just... Pound scriptures over their heads. Thank God for the word. You know we believe in the power of the word. But Jesus is offering her life and hope. Those of you that preach on the street, you go out there and just thunder about hell and you're just going to have people turn on you. If you're going to go out there and preach anything to this on these streets here, you talk about hope and faith and love of God for the lost. Now Jesus died to deliver them from the bondages of sin. Amen?
Then finally, when he does ex expose her sin, it's done so lovingly. He says, he said, he said, thou hast had five husbands, and the one that thou hast is not thy husband. But he didn't say, hey, look, you're living in adultery. You go clean up your life, and you go get that man and tell him you can't live with him anymore. And then you come back tomorrow after you have separated from the man. No, he knew she couldn't have any power in herself to do that until she was endued with the Spirit of God. We're demanding things from people that they can't possibly do until they're thoroughly convinced and taught. Hallelujah. Oh, see, Brother Dave, how are we going to reach them? Well, Jesus said, I've got to go there. I've got to go to somewhere. He had to go there. You don't reach them if you're going to stay in Jerusalem and pray for them. He said, I've got to go there. You've got to go to the well, to the parcel of ground. Go wherever God leads you. You've got to go to them. Amen. That's very simple, I think. Finally, Jesus promised a reward to those who go out to the harvest. He's promised a great reward. Look at verse 36. And he that reapeth receiveth wages and gather fruit unto eternal life. He that reapeth receiveth wages. Folks, before I close, can I, I've got to talk to you very lovingly about this. Look at me. Look this way, please. Look in my direction for just a moment. I want to talk about uh, witnessing. I want you to know that the Lord never puts a guilt trip on you. He doesn't demand that you go out and be a soul winner. He doesn't demand that you witness to everybody that you see. I, I've been guilty, especially when I was a younger preacher. I, I would just thunder at people. I as well as told them they go to hell. You don't get out there and, and, and they would go out, but the people were not out there with the joy. They weren't out there as witnessing the overflow of the love that God had filled them with. It was a sense of duty. It was a sense of guilt. It was a sense of fear. And I put a lot of people under guilt. I put a lot of people under fear. The Holy Ghost began to deal with me about that. And I want you to know, Jesus is not putting anybody under guilt. About He said, there's a white harvest field. We need laborers. But he doesn't come with any condemnation. He comes with a reward. He, he says, I want to tell you what you'll get. I, he, he shows us the glory of it. In fact, the scripture says, he that with his souls is wise. He, he, he's saying, behold, the righteous shall be rewarded in the earth. That's Proverbs 1130. You'll be rewarded, the reward. And, and then he, he says, he, uh, and he that reapeth receiveth wages. The wages of joy, the same joy the angels get when they hear and see that sinners repent. The Bible says they rejoice over one sinner that repenteth. How much more do you and I get the reward of incredible joy when we win the loss? And what the Lord is saying, look, I'm not, I'm not forcing you out. I'm not going to put a trip on you. But he's going to tell you, when you do that, you're going to come out of this. You're going to experience joy like you've never known. You're going to be, you're going to have your eyes open. There's going to be wisdom come to you like you've never had before. He that goeth forth weeping, bearing precious seed, shall doubtless come again rejoicing, bringing with him his seeds. How many are hearing that? How many are hearing that? Folks, Pastor Carter and I could come up here. He, he has a, a, enough skill, and I believe I have enough experience that we could get up here. And we could just keep pounding and pounding and pounding, go out, win souls, witness to everybody you can, and do this, do that, and drive you. And it would be done by fear. You wouldn't come to this church with joy. There would just be a heaviness hanging over everybody. The Lord's not doing that in this. He's saying, look, if you will go out, he that reaps... You go out, it's, it's time to reap. I'll go with you, I'll lead you, I'll show you where to go. If you'll make this a matter of prayer, I'll lead you. I'm going to lead your pastors first, I'm going to lead you. He's leading us in that direction. And, he's, and folks, we want to set example, you just follow. And the Lord is saying, I'm going to give you wisdom, I'm going to reward you, I'm going to give you joy. And when you go out, you're going to come back to Times Square Church rejoicing like you've never rejoiced before. You will come back, you go out with tears. You go out with the burden of the Lord, and even those tears you can't produce. 
You have to let the Holy Ghost do it. And you can't really get those tears till you go out and hear the report of these people. The thing that broke my heart is I was out there and listened and heard, and that's what broke my heart. I couldn't get it just reading about them. I had to hear it from them firsthand. And, and now the Lord's coming to, to us. He's coming to me. He's saying, David, I'm not going to put a burden on you. But if you want it, I'm going to give you my burden. And I'm, I'm going to give you wisdom on how to talk to people. And I'm going to give you joy like you have never known. Folks, we, Pastor Carter and I and the staff here, we'll know when you have obeyed the Holy Spirit on this and when you're witnessing and winning souls, you won't be able to sit down for a minute in this church. The whole hour of worship and praise here, you'll be so on fire. Everybody around you is going to feel it. The heat of it is going to be so marvelous because you're going to be so excited about Jesus and what he's doing through you and in you. That's what it's all about. I will honor you. I will bless you. Listen to this now before closing. Why, why should we go out now for the lost souls that both he that soweth and he that reapeth may rejoice together? Folks, this is about rejoicing. Hallelujah. This is not some heavy trip. He said, my yoke is easy. My burden is light. If you, uh, what, I know one of Brother Carter's favorite songs, I get so thrilled with Jesus. Because he sings it every chance he gets. And I love it. That's, that's the secret. If you're thrilled with Jesus, you can't hold it in. Hallelujah. Have you heard it? Will you stand? Glory to Jesus. Now, folks, I did that in 45 minutes. Didn't overpreach you. Please don't leave yet. We, God, God's not done. I'm not going to give you another sermon. Beloved, listen. I thank God. You've got to hear this now. I thank God for this church. I've preached to thousands all over the world, but I thank God for this church. I thank God that it's interracial. I thank God that we have over 103 nationalities. I thank God that this has become a testimony to this city and the nation that people of different races and colors can get together and be one in Christ. I thank God for that. I think I can speak for Brother Carter and I can speak for myself. We've never felt more loved, respected anywhere in the face of the earth. We thank God for that respect and that love. You know that the pastors here have never tried to beat you down. We've never, tried, we've never been after money. We've tried to set an example. But I honestly believe with all my heart this church is being led now by the Holy Spirit to reach this city in some way. We have a number of things that God's put on our hearts. But the pastors can't do it alone. Everybody in this building, up there behind me, I want you to pledge tonight. I say it solemnly and, it, and as loving as I can. I want you to pledge that you will seek God. How you'll seek the Holy Spirit. Ask him how he can start leading you to souls. Asking who to go to and to give you opportunities. Say, Holy Ghost, pray. God, give me opportunity. Open the door. Open the door. And when you see somebody crying, you see somebody hurting, you see somebody in need, don't walk by. Ask God. I'm asking God to never again. God help me. I'll not do that again. I'll go to that person. I'll sit down on the, on the ground. I'll do anything to reach out. If they reject you, you've done your part. What about your families? All you, all that have been saved from sin, the witness and, and, uh, and children that you've lost. Whoever it may be to reach out, you've got a circle. Work in that circle. I got. I have a feeling from the Holy Spirit that you're going to hear more and more of this. I understand, Brother Carter is telling me something of what God is talking to him about for Friday night. It's called uh, cold, cold water evangelism, giving a drink of cold water. 
Now that's the Holy Ghost because we don't consult with one another what to preach. So I take that as God saying to us, move with me and I'll make you all soul winners and I'll give you one of the greatest harvests and you'll make an impact on this city. Are you satisfied just to come and get fed and just hear sermon after sermon? Is that going to satisfy you? I don't think so because I know this congregation loves the Lord too much. You have the, you have the burden of the Lord. Like I've not seen anywhere on the face of the earth, the burden of the Lord. Ask God, all you fellows from Timothy House, we've got a whole group coming next graduation of the Bible school. We have a whole group coming and they're going to be all over the streets and they're going to be taking some of you with them. It's going to be one-on-one -on -one evangelism all over Manhattan and other places. We want to believe God. Why don't you pray? Some of you can get together and God will tell you what to do. Some people are, are, are having a little book stand. They just put a little table and books out there and, and offer them to people going by. We can't reach into Queens. Some of you live in Queens. We can't go all these places, but you're there. You're going to have to do it. You pray and ask God. Uh, uh, Pastor Carter, one of, uh, I think it was Michael you were telling me about. Are, are you going to tell about that Friday night? Maybe he, He's just going up into, is it Harlem? Harlem? Just knocking on doors and asking if, if he can help the kids with their homework. And, and boy, now they're calling him. He's got a whole bunch of kids, and the parents are calling, saying, "My kid's on drugs." Is Michael here? I guess he's not here tonight. He's probably out uh, knocking on doors. <laughs> and by the way, that's the only excuse for not being here. Any, anybody from Times Square Church watching television Tuesday night or any other time they should be in this house, we're going to have such power here, we're going to blow your tube out <laughs> through prayer. You're going to say, honey, this thing's not working. <laughs> or you get so miserable. Amen. Folks, we're not trying to be facetious. We're trying to follow the work of the Holy Spirit. You know something with this? I close. To me, that's revival. To me, that's what this is all about. It's not just getting some manifestation. You know, with all of our preachers, we still have some people running off. Still going places. Look for it. I want to tell you, if you're going to get in the plane and go get revival, I'm going to look you right in the eye with all the love of my heart and say, why aren't you in Harlem. Why aren't you, instead of doing that, why aren't you on the street? Why aren't you witness souls? Why aren't you bringing souls in here? Don't come and tell me where you went and got a blessing until you can show me the souls that you're winning right here in New York City. <laughs> well, what a blessing to see all these people baptized. I'd like to see it going on for a whole hour, all through, all through the meeting and, and maybe have to have a special night where it's two hours of just bab a water baptism service every month was just water baptisms. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Heavenly Father, I, I have a stirring in my heart and I believe everybody that loves you feels that stirring of the Holy Ghost. We're not trying to work something up in the flesh. It's truth that sets us free. It's truth that puts a foundation under us. Lord, there's nobody here to go under guilt or fear or condemnation. We want to stand before you, Lord Jesus, bringing fruit. Hallelujah. We want to lay fruit down at your feet. Hallelujah. And Lord, while we're here on earth, we want to have the blessing and the rejoicing of a harvest. Hallelujah. We love you, Jesus, in this church. Hallelujah. This is the conclusion of the message.